Um, I'm here to talk about evolution and future of deployments. Uh, my name is Brandon. Um, I'm actually uh, Armory's newest uh, engineer. Started there two months ago. Um, it's been a blast. Uh, but uh, a little bit about me, as I said, software engineer at Armory. I love to automate anything that I can. At my last job, that was, I'm gonna talk more about this, but uh, at my last job, um, everything was manual. Uh, everything. So I tried to automate as much as I can to take the human error out of the problem. Um, you can follow me on GitHub, Twitter, those are my handles on that. And next, uh, I'm gonna get to know you guys a little bit. So how many of you are still deploying manually to like local data centers? Anybody still doing that? Okay, that's good. Uh, deploying only to the cloud. All right. Um, how many of you are actually deploying with Spinnaker right now? All right. Um, what about in three months from now? Looking for more adopters? Awesome. So uh, I want to talk about a brief history of uh, deployments, kind of from the, the very beginning. So in the beginning, software was deployed with the hardware. You wanted new software, you had to buy new hardware. Not the best when you think about it today. Uh, it was extremely costly back then to, to update your software. You were pretty much locked into whatever vendor uh, so that you bought the hardware from. So we had the advent of the microcomputers. Software was sent out to customers either on tape, later on on floppy disks, a little while later CD-ROMs, um, DVDs came way later. Um, so we had ways of, of delivering software to our users at a, at a much quicker pace, but still not quick enough. So the internet was born. This changed the game, but only to those who actually paid attention to what you could now do. There were still too many people uh, deploying their software with CD-ROMs. Um, if you're a big fan of video games, you had to go to the store, wait in line, buy the new expansion pack for your favorite game. I remember doing that for uh, Diablo 2 when that came out many years ago. Uh, one of my all-time favorite games. Nowadays, I can just go to Blizzard store, buy the game, have it downloaded in 10 minutes, and I don't even have to put pants on. Um, you could do all of that type of stuff now. It, things have changed drastically. Uh, and again, software was uh, no longer running on the same machine. There was software uh, that was from somebody else's machine that you had possibly no idea who it was. So I want to do a quick pause here. Um, anybody see a problem with the way software used to be delivered back in the olden days, I, I should say? Um, Still, extremely slowly. Um, there was no such thing as sending out patches uh, for most, most software. Um, video games didn't really see it. It wasn't until much later. Um, if it was like a security patch for an operating system, depending on who the provider was, you may get lucky. Um, sometimes there, if there's a security vulnerability, nobody cared. Um, so it, it took months, if not years, to deploy new versions of software. All right, so then we can go to manual deployments. I kind of mentioned this a little earlier. Uh, my last job was manual deployments. These were the steps I had to do to deploy our software in production. SSH into a physical machine. Pull the code down compile the code, deploy the code, then go to step one for each machine that we had uh, for our application. By the time I left, we had six machines. So upgrades uh, took you know, about 45 minutes to maybe an hour, uh, depending if the upgrade was quick and easy or if we ran into issues. If we ran into issues, sometimes we had to roll back if that was possible. It wasn't always possible. So there's a lot of, a lot of issues with uh, this manual deployment. 
Uh, then we go into configuration management tools, stuff like Ansible, Chef, Puppet, Salt, uh, but probably some that I didn't list on here. Um, it helps reduce the complexity. Uh, some things are no longer manual, which is a very, very, very good step. Um, and it can have, you can have a history of your actual configuration and how stuff has changed over, over time. Not something that you typically have with a manual deployment unless you were the type of person to go out, go and grab your, your physical pad, and, pad of paper and a pen and write down, we did this change on this day, this time, these are the changes, these are the issues we ran into. And then if you were lucky enough to have a ticketing system of some sort, maybe populating that ticketing system. Um, so there was plenty of, uh, plenty of issues. Uh, configuration management's helped solve some of them. Now we can start talking about continuous integration and, and delivery. This, th these processes can, they kind of enabled the whole software as a service thing uh, a lot nicer. Um, and when you have thousands of users, you can't do things manually because in, in the thousands of users cases, you may have 100 different machines. If it takes five minutes to SSH and pull down your code, compile and deploy your application per one machine, you have 100 machines, that's a long time spent on kind of a redundant task. Uh, CI and CD kind of helped uh, alleviate some of those needs. And some of the tools used, Jenkins, Bamboo, CircleCI, Travis CI. At my last job, we used GitLab CI. Um, I didn't put GitLab CI on here because that's relatively newer. Uh, these have all been out for a few, a much longer time than, than GitLab CI. Uh, but they all do roughly the same thing. There's obviously minor differences and sometimes big differences between the two. But essentially, they, they all do the same type of thing. So where are we today? So with those of you with weak hearts, please leave the room now. Some of us are still stuck in the past. As I said, my, current, my, my, my previous job, this is what we had to do. Um, so again, SSH into, into a physical machine, pulling the code down, compiling, deploying, and go to one for each machine in, in, in the process. It's really not sustainable. Uh, stuck in the past part two. Some, we, we did eventually make the, the switch from physical machines to virtual machines. Yay! But still, there was plenty of issues with that. Um, you could also uh, use some cloud provider, but if you're still doing those manual steps of manually SSHing into an EC2 instance and doing all those other things, you're not really getting a lot of the benefits. Um, and you could also use CI tools to help cut down on some of the build times and like, generate some artifacts. And that's what we did. Uh, we had multiple um, Java web applications. And what we would do is we would use CI to build those. And then uh, part of our deployment process was to pull down the pre-compiled code and, and, and deploy it for us. So it was less time spent. When I first started at, that, at the company uh, in 2013, build times were about an hour and a half. Uh, by the time I left uh, August of this year, build times are down to five minutes. Um, so we did a lot of work to, to do that, and it was unfortunately so much work. Uh, and that kind of goes into the scripts plus CI and CD. We had scripts on top of GitLab CI to go ahead and help cut down on some of that cruft for us. Um, uh, a git push essentially triggered a, a CI job to kick off a build script. The build script would produce some sort of artifact. We would upload it to a Sonotype uh, Nexus uh, server um, to, to handle all of that. Um, and then again, we had another script to uh, deploy the resulting artifact. There's a big problem with this though. There's no dashboard to see where you are in this process. You can kind of look, if you're using a C, some of the CI tools, they do have pipeline stages, I, I know GitLab does, um, but they're not, not, the, not the best. You have to, they're not as nice as what Spinnaker provides. Um, but if you don't, ha unfortunately, if you don't have, uh, your, your, if your tooling doesn't have some sort of dashboard to see, you're kind of left in the dark as to where you are in your deployment. And then where we are today, uh, Spinnaker. 
has notifications built in, pipelines, cool things like automated canary analysis. There was a few talks and there was a workshop yesterday on that. Um, so these are things that we get with Spinnaker. Uh, things that we didn't, we would have to build extra tooling on top of a bunch of other tooling in order to get something like this. So next I want to talk about stages of software delivery. But before I do that, let's play a game. Uh, there used to be paper and pencils on everybody's uh, uh, seats, but um, these slides will be available afterwards. But the thing is, uh, with this game, we're going we're gonna to talk about a few different things, um, have a bunch of points, and we're going to see where we fall in a, a list of about five different stages. So the number of deployments um, per month. So my last place, one to two deployments per month was actually a, a good month. Uh, some months we had zero um, because of, I worked at a university, uh, they were, they, they didn't like change, which I totally understand it. It made sense for a, a lot of cases. We didn't have a lot of tooling to help us. So one to two deployments per month was about average for us. Um, if you do one to two deployments per month, give yourself a point. Three to 10 deployments per month, two points. Um, and if you are awesome and doing like 900 plus deployments in a month, uh, give yourself 10 points. Um, and, and 900 plus deployments per month is an insane number. Um, is that the production deployments? Yeah, yeah, production deployments. Um, I was lucky enough to, before I left my, my last job, I set up deployments to our dev and staging environments. Uh, so we were getting up maybe not to 900 per month, but definitely in about the 100 range. Um, but the issue is that it never got to production. Nobody actually was able to test it. Um, so if you're deploying, to, deploying that much to, to dev and like a staging, that's awesome. That's a great first step. But if you're not doing it to production, not getting real users to use it, in many cases, you're kind of left in the dust and it, you don't know if what you're doing is actually going to work. Um, and I know some places have unbelievable scale to keep in mind. And you know, maybe taking 5% of their traffic to like a, a dev uh, server might be a good thing, but that's only 5% of their traffic. Um, if we were to do that where, where I was before, that would be maybe one user. Um, so not much, uh, not a really good, uh, good test, really. So the number of manual steps to deploy. Uh, 20 plus, give yourself a point. If you have zero manual steps to deploy, give yourself 10. And pat yourself on the back, because that's actually probably one of the hardest things to do, is getting from a full manual process down to zero. Getting down to one to three, is, is extremely challenging and going to that zero, that can take a, an inordinate amount of time. But it, once you get there, you will be so thankful. Uh, before I continue, um, anybody doing 20 plus manual steps to deploy to production? No hands? Awesome, you guys are on your way. Uh, how many of you are actually doing zero uh, manual steps to deploy to, to production? All right, good, good. So if you guys can help the rest of the room get to that point, I think everybody here would greatly appreciate it. Um, I definitely know at my last place, I definitely would have loved to talk to you guys. So the time to deploy. Uh, so how many, um, how many months does it take for something to actually get to production? Um, or in this case, minutes. It takes minutes for your code to be checked in and goes to production. Um, if, again, if, you, if it took over a month or so, you know, give yourself a point. If it takes minutes to get to production, give yourself 10 points. All right, so dev versus ops versus dev ops. If you're a dev, and op, dev versus ops shop, give yourself a point. If you fully embrace the DevOps culture, give yourself three. And also pat yourself on the back. That one is a really hard, a hard sell in, in, in many cases. Um, what does that say? 
uh, mutable versus mutable deploys. If your deployment is, a, is mutable, give yourself actually, uh, maybe not even one point, maybe zero. Um, it's never a good thing. You don't know what has changed. Uh, you're, you can be left in a very inconsistent state. Um, if you have immutable infrastructure and immutable deploys, give yourself three points. All right, so these are extra. Pick all that apply. So if you're deploying to your own you know, small data center, I mean, if you're somebody like Google who has data centers, yeah, I mean, you, I don't think this really applies to you. Um, if you're deploying to the cloud, uh, give yourself two points. If you're doing continuous deployments, give yourself seven. If you're using microservices and have embraced the splitting up of a giant monolith into something that's actually more manageable, give yourself seven points. If you're doing automated rollbacks, which is a phenomenal feature, give yourself 10 points. Anybody here using automated rollbacks? No? Aw, oh, come on guys, we're at the spin. Okay, okay, we got one. Good. All right, so these are the stages of, of, of software delivery. So we have at the very, the very bottom part, stage one, it's a snail, very, very slow. Um, you can kind of see where I got the uh, points idea from. If you take, I don't know how well you guys can read that. Um, but the, the bottom section kind of helps correlate uh, to those points. So where do you stack up? If you have zero to six points, you're, you're in stage one, unfortunately. Um, seven to 15 in, in about stage two. Uh, 16 to 43, about stage three. 43 to 56, uh, stage four, or 57 plus, awesome, you're in stage five. So the big question is, is, is why am I talking about this? We need to move people along these stages. If we have more people closer in, in the stages three, four, and five, the better off every developer is going to be. Being stuck in a stage one is a little demoralizing once you have learned about other ways of deploying software. You'll get very frustrated with having to come in at, in, in my case, 4 a.m. on a Wednesday morning to deploy something to production. And you still had to put in your full day's worth of work in case something went wrong. Um, so we, we need to help people in those situations come up to speed. Uh, getting everybody to stage five would be a phenomenal idea. I know it's not possible, but if we can get them closer to stage five, that would be ideal. So how do we actually do this? So moving from stage to stage. So unfortunately, again, we can't go from stage one to, to five in 60 seconds. It's, some of the concepts are harder to understand. Um, automated canary analysis. If you were to talk to a, a student, uh, a, a student at a university, uh, a canary is a bird, I think, um, not something to do with software. They may have a harder time understanding that concept. Um, even uh, senior developers who have never had an opportunity to work in this type of environment may not know what a canary is. They should hopefully be able to pick it up rather quickly, but in some cases that, that may not be true. Um, it's also a very large learning curve. Um, I went from a stage one company to pretty much a stage five. Um, so it is possible, but mostly for the individual, not for the company. Um, and I will tell you the learning curve, I've been at this job now for two months with Armory. Oh man, I have learned so much over the last two months on automated uh, rollbacks, canary analysis, um, the pipeline concept, being able to codify that pipeline so that way you know what has changed with the pipeline. All of these types of things are amazing and there, it's a lot to take in. You have to spend a, a large amount of time to get familiar with everything. So you're able to come up here next year and, and give a talk. Um, stakeholders may be unable to advance due to either political reasons, money reasons, you know, time, resources, people. If you have a very small department, um, my entire I IT department was about 35 people. Uh, that included developers, operations people, server people, um, procurement people, 
uh, from a developer standpoint, we had like four developers, um, and we managed all of the resources for the university. That's a lot to, to handle for four developers. Um, we, we managed to make do with what we had, and it's a public university, so funding is hard to come by. So being able to hire people ha has always been a problem for them. Um, so that's partially why stakeholders may be unable to advance not enough people, uh, not enough money to, to spend on, on, on products. Yes, Spinnaker is open source, but if you don't understand Spinnaker to begin with, you may need consulting. You may need people to come and help you set that up, or at least teach you the, the basics. That's gonna cost money. And, and unfortunately, a lot of companies don't have that ability. So what can we do? We need to get more people to come to events like this, or meetup groups. Um, oh, Alex, is Alex in the room? No. Um, one of the people at Armory has uh, one of the largest Spinnaker meetup groups in the, actually I think it is the largest Spinnaker meetup group in the Bay Area, like 14, 1500 members, something like that. Um, we need to start getting people into those events and teaching them, hey, these are the basics, this is how this works. Here's where you can help us. Uh, here's, uh, I went to a talk earlier today from, uh, I think it was Emily and, um, and Lars about how to get more people to help contribute to open source. Perfect, we need more talks like that. We need to get people interested in, in helping the project. That kind of talks to make the pain points less painful. If we can do that, everybody's gonna be better off. Um, and we can help build and contribute to, to better tools. And Spinnaker, I believe, is one of the better tools out there. So I want to kind of switch gears a little bit and let's talk about the future. What are some cool things that we can do? So Internet of Things, deploying to a Raspberry Pi, hooking up Spinnaker to actually deploy to a Raspberry Pi. Uh, one of my coworkers, uh, his name's Kevin. Uh, oh, he's not in the room. Dang it. Um, so we have this thing called the flip disk. Um, unfortunately, the animation is not the best, uh, but essentially, um, him and I work on it, and one of his friend, well, one of our friends, works on it after work every now and then. And um, it essentially, we can play like uh, an animated GIF uh, with it. We could um, display images, and it essentially like takes an image and like pixelates it kind of into like a black and white photo, and be able to display it. It's a really cool, really cool tool. Um, so we've talked about potentially adding a cloud driver thing to actually deploy to a Raspberry Pi. Um, I don't know how much work is involved with that, but I think it'd be really cool. Deploying to medical devices. This one's actually really cool. Uh, I'm actually a type one diabetic, and there's so many cool medical devices for them, for, for diabetics. There's continuous glucose monitors, there's insulin pumps. All of it has software in it nowadays. Why not use something like Spinnaker to deploy to it? Or even something, maybe Spinnaker is not the tool 10 years from now. Maybe we get something else. Being able to deploy to medical devices. Uh, pacemakers have software in them now. Um, it's kind of scary to think about. Security obviously will need to be tightened down a lot. Um, I personally don't know if I would trust a medical device uh, like that, but you know, maybe in a few years, once uh, the stuff gets a lot better, um, it'll be, it'll actually be worthwhile. Um, there's medical devices that actually ship off data to your doctor for you to, or uh, there's a company called Dexcom. They make a continuous glucose monitor. And what it can actually do is send out text message alerts to like your family if you have low blood sugar. Uh, if you have low blood sugar, you have the uh, high chance of dying. Um, so this can help alert people that, hey, somebody needs to come and, and, and save me right now. Um, so there is a bunch of software going on in, in these tools or in these devices. It, that software needs to be updated. Nobody wants to have a medical device that has a security vulnerability that is connected to Wi-Fi. Um, that would just be a very, very, very scary thought. Deploying to cars. I really like this one. I'm actually from the Metro Detroit area, so like half the people I know works for either Ford, Chrysler, or GM. These guys are actually in this game now. They're, they are working on autonomous vehicles. Uh, I think it was GM and Honda, was it? Are teaming, may, have, may not have been Honda, but are teaming up to do some 
autonomous vehicle stuff. That's awesome. That's all software, it's, it's, it's hardware as well, but they, they, need, uh, they need software to, to be updated. Um, the thing is, if, if the big three are deploying software, that means we're actually in a pretty good game right now. Um, typically, the auto industry has been a little bit further behind when it has come to software. Um, they have now started to embrace stuff like uh, uh, the Google and Apple both have infotainment systems available for, for vehicles. They have now started to fully embrace that. Um, they're, they're changing. Uh, th that, that's a sign we need to take a look at and say, hey, guys, maybe you should help join us. Um, and autonomous vehicles will need updates as well. So uh, the next thing is deploying to the cloud, not the cloud. Um, what I mean by that is being able to take your application and one pipeline and be able to deploy it to any cloud, cloud agnostic essentially, because it doesn't really matter what cloud you're on as long as you can contact all other services that are required for that, that service to, to actually function. So does it matter if, if one piece is in Azure, the other one's in, in Google, the other one's in AWS, the other one's in, I don't know, your own local data center? It doesn't really matter. Um, we could potentially help to work something like this into the product. You don't really have to think of the cloud. The developer doesn't need to care where the application is deployed. It's, we're kind of at that point right now, but in some cases, uh, you're tied to a specific uh, cloud provider, like somebody maybe deep into GCP for certain reasons. Uh, but you, don't, you may not want to have to think about that if you're a newer developer. You just want to write your code and, and, and go home. Um, so this is one thing that we could, we could potentially do. Uh, so this is essentially the, the future of, uh, of uh, what, I, what I've been thinking about. Two I'm really interested in are obviously the medical devices and, and, and the car aspect. Um, there's probably other things that I, if you give me more time, I could probably think about. I'm sure you guys have some awesome ideas on where to take this as well. So I'm going to transition a little bit. I work at Armory. We're hiring. Uh, if you want to work somewhere awesome, talk to me. Uh, I think our booth is still up over just right across the hall. Uh, come talk to us. Even if you have, if, if you're from a stage one company, you can still go to Armory. I'm, I'm proof of that. I've been here for two months. I have learned a ton. And I think if, you, if any of you were to join, join the team, you would as well. Um, I work with a lot of really awesome engineers that have just done an awesome job of, of, of teaching me everything that a, a good developer should know. <laughs> um, so with that, Thank you guys. Um, anybody have any questions?